Great. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do and about the businesses you're in and some of the places that you're really focused on um, looking at the community as well? And I'm going to pull sure. up my, my notes here really quick. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you for just such a great um, overview of Proverbs 31 especially. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica. Uh, I currently work in family business at MNC Group, particularly in the uh, financial services portion of the business in digital financial services. So it has a lot to do more with FinTech and our education side, which is um, our university, and then also our CSR portion, which is the philanthropy side. And on top of that, um, I also just recently got appointed as chairwoman of the honorary board at uh, PMI. So that's Red Cross Indonesia. Um, and I'm also in a few other initiatives, um, including Bible translations in Indonesia. That's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to share with us mm, today. Thank you. I'm excited for this conversation. So if you didn't know, Jessica is also a Resource Global alum. Yes. And is on the junior board for Resource Global. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to start with kind of, you know, coming through Resource Global, right? Everybody here today is going to graduate and finish up with their cohort work. Um, what were some of the challenges that you face in your job each day as you think about how to apply everything that, you know, all of our soon-to-be Resource Global alums by the end of today are going to be going back into the workplace on Monday? Right. I think a lot of people can agree with me that one of the biggest challenges of daily work is dealing with people. <laughs> um, dealing with people, dealing with teams, uh, just a v diverse um, group of people, especially especially if you're managing various teams under you. Um, dealing with people is always really hard because people are dynamic. Um, they have different things going on in their lives, mm -hmm. different situations that might bleed into their work. Uh, and I think that's the most difficult part about running an organization. And one that is particularly perhaps more um, long established because I entered into family business um, not as something that I started, but it's yeah. something that I stepped into. And so ha being able to come into that and being able to enter into an existing, pre existing culture, I think, mm -hmm. um, and being able to come into that culture as a relatively younger, newer leader. Yeah. I think that was uh, the biggest challenge at first. And trying to also understand that I'm not my dad, mm -hmm. you know, and how perhaps like his style of leadership is very different to mine, that I don't have to fill in the shoes that he has. Yeah. I think that's something that I had to learn over the years. And I think every leader needs to know that it's okay to not be, um, like a leader that you actually look up to, you know, yeah. and that every one of us are gifted with different personalities, different um, giftings as well, for sure, to step into that position that God has already placed for us. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. And you can hear that, you know, probably one of the biggest challenges is really walking out. How do we love people, right? Yeah. <laughs> you yes, know, God calls sure. us to it, but it's, it's, it's a yeah. sacrifice, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Really figuring out how to help people excel in their jobs yeah. when they are bringing, they bring their whole selves, don't yes. they? Yeah. Yes. Maybe if I can share kind of like an example. Oh, um, I love that. Yeah. And this is perhaps not an example that I would previously bring, you know. Um, one of the biggest things for me personally that I feel is a big challenge is to reprimand people. Mm -hmm. And oh. reprimand to the point of actually giving them an aspect. You know, like a, like a warning letter. Yeah. Um, like you can talk to them, you can try to gauge with them where they're going and in, in, in their lives. Why are they performing this way? Why are they not working in the team? You know, but when it gets to the point where you need to kind of like put your foot down and be like, okay, this is enough. You're creating a mess for the team. And so we need to give you a warning letter. Yeah. Um, I think that's not unloving. I think that's something that needs to be said because I think sometimes people like what you said um, say you want to grow in servant leadership it doesn't mean you're a doormat right right so when someone's not doing their job it's okay to tell them and actually this happened quite recently um, while I was on a trip um, with my husband 
uh, that someone in the team was not doing the job very well and she was creating some sort of, uh, I guess, friction within the mm -hmm. team because this person has been in the team for a very long time, even before, maybe before I was born actually, she, <laughs> she'd been working in the company. Um, so she's been in the company for so long. She's been, I guess, privileged to be seen as someone senior in the company, even though her position is not uh, as senior as some. But because of that, she felt that she had this, she could do whatever she wanted. Yeah. And we have been trying to, over time, um, tell her, give her proper SOPs and things like that. But after giving so many chances, it seemed like this person's not growing. Yeah. This person's not listening. This person's not cooperating. And so we ended up having to come to that difficult decision of saying, hey, we have to issue a warning letter to her that if she doesn't change for the betterment of the team, then there might be a time where th that's it. Like yeah. she can't work here anymore. Not because we wanna out her, you know? We don't wanna oust her that way. We want her to see this as a means for her to grow, as a means for her to change. And I think that's quite important for us to know, mm -hmm. especially as younger leaders who sometimes feel like, oh, because for me, the hardest thing is to actually like let go of people. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, like it's, it's so hard. Um, but if we look at it from a different perspective where we say, hey, it's for the betterment of the team and also perhaps it's better for her. It's better for her growth, for her character, you know, and better for her in the longer run as well. Because there will come a time when perhaps she's working for different teams, you know, and and th we are doing it out of a place of love rather than out of a place of wanting to oust her. Yeah, that is actually a, a perfect example, right, of thinking about kind of those components of servant leadership that it's, um, you know, if a person's in the wrong job, mm -hmm. yeah. they're, th they're, it's not going to match their skill sets. And yeah. so they can learn and learn, but it's super frustrating. And that part of being a servant leader is taking the responsibility on your, on, mm -hmm. as a leader to have hard conversations to empower people to thrive. And if you don't have those conversations, then your company is not going to be as profitable. Yeah. It's not going to be as effective, right? Because there's, there's gonna be friction and, and frustrations on the team. Yeah. And so it's essential. Yeah. And I love it because these are the essential like hard conversations that take strength, right? Would you say that you have to like really <laughs> gear yourself up with like strength? Gosh to have these conversations. But then, you know, our theme, when we're thinking about Proverbs 31, it's not just about being strong as a leader. Mm -hmm. It's about then saying, with this position of leadership that I have, now how do I turn around and serve? Yeah. And both serving your employees, which you saw in this example, but also um, serving in our cities and in our, our communities. So this can be in our, our church, um, in charitable causes, and ministries, or yaya sons. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about how do you decide, you know, you? I can hear from your examples, you're serving your employees. How do you decide, you know, once you look at the resources you have then to invest in, in your community and city, how do you decide where to serve? And, you know, with, right. with the Red Cross and different organizations, um, what are some of the criteria that you look at to say, should we be, you know, opening our hands mm -hmm. in this place? I think, um, so it's two ways. Firstly, if it's serving through the company's funds and resources, one of the ways that I would look at it is, how can we um, help in places that a lot of people still don't touch? I think particularly because our company is mainly in media. Um, we have a role and also the privilege of being able to voice out concerns that otherwise people might not be really aware of. Um, but on top of that, also come alongside with, for example, like government initiatives that are in place, um, for example, like Re most recently with stunting, I think everyone's um, heard a lot about how our president has also been talking about the problem of stunting and how to curb it in Indonesia. And so we come alongside that. But for me personally, when it comes to personal resources, I think some of the things that I think about and I pray on prior to committing myself, um, and, and that's something that I've had to learn over the years as well, because I think, um, I 
I learned to open up my hands quite early on in life, mm -hmm. um, but without really thinking about what initiatives I wanted to really focus on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's something that I, I thank God for because in a way it really opened my eyes to various initiatives. But over the years, I think it's gotten a bit more um, focused. So if we can kind of divide it into like categories, yeah. it probably is um, surrounding the theme of uh, Bible translations, mm -hmm. the theology of work, mm -hmm. and then thirdly, in um, disability services. Yeah. yeah. Um, and support. And why those three, uh, I think how I ended up um, kind of focusing on those three initiatives as kind of like a lifelong goal is to prayerfully ask the Lord first, like what is it that the Lord has placed in my heart all these years? Um, because as much as the heart is a deceitful mm -hmm. thing, scripture says that, the Lord does speak to us yeah. um, with the desires of our hearts. And I think that's worth bringing before the Lord and saying, hey, Lord, this is what I feel. This is what breaks my heart. And is this where you want me to serve in? And um, on top of that, to see the need as well, um, particularly maybe a little story as well, how I ended up in... Um, supporting disability services and so forth. And actually here we have Palm, <laughs> who we started a foundation together with, alongside with my husband as well, called Yesus, so it's Y-S-U-S. Yes, and Saluran Unglo Sasama, which abbreviated as Jesus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and basically the Love reason it. why we started this, this Yayasan, um, Palm has, has a huge heart as well. Uh, for children with disability and it's just that God really placed so many people in our lives with similar passions mm -hmm. um, and also I personally have very close friends who um, gave birth with for gave birth to children with disability and I saw firsthand like their struggles of um, gaining I guess acceptance mm -hmm. and not just acceptance but also um, care yeah. and thinking through how they can in the future um, raise their kids in, in an inclusive environment. I think that was like a big hit for me when I saw that firsthand. And so that's kind of how like I ended up thinking about, okay, Lord, why do you put so many people in my life um, and so many stories that you really just unravel before me uh, to see the hurt that people feel, and so let me step into that, yeah. you know, and then, so so, that, so that's with disability, and then with the theology of work, I think just a bit of personal background as well. Um, I personally wanted to go into full-time ministry mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, prior to Bible college. Um, I wanted to serve in the church, because I thought that was how um, I, I was able to serve God most but it was in seminary that the Lord really, like, I guess, tugged at my heart to be a lot more uh, open to the fact that, hey, God's mission field is so much wider than what we think it is. I love how, Hannah, you mentioned that when we talk about loving others, sometimes it also begins in the household, the yeah. people that are closest to us, you know, and that also flows through for me personally um, within family business. Mm -hmm. You know, if if my mind was so fixated on like, oh, I want to go somewhere far to serve others. Well, these are a group of people that God has already placed in my life, you know, for me to love and serve, you know. And why do I have to go elsewhere finding people when God's already placed um, people right there? And so I think that's kind of how I started softening my heart towards thinking about, okay, maybe going back into the workplace isn't such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes, and I think everyone here, especially having been part of the Resource Global family, can perhaps testify to knowing that like work um, is 
a means of us to serve God. Work is a means for us to glorify God. And that's something that we all have to wrestle with our daily struggles, with, with, with our own um, spheres of influences. And I think it's a lot more um, challenging and we need to be a lot more prayerful yeah. <laughs> about it and we need to apply wisdom <laughs> uh, in it because yeah. every person's work is different, mm -hmm. um, but it all flows from the same master Yeah, and um, we're all at the end of the day serving God. I love that. Thank yeah. you for sharing that, too, because I think sometimes we can think, oh, because I'm in business or because I'm running a company, I'm not in full-time ministry. And, you know, we have to shift that mindset to think about every day that I show up, I am in ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm ministering to employees. I have opportunities to minister in my communities and in our cities. And so we want to think about it, mm -hmm. you know, as, as you saw the shift in the opportunities to really serve. It's really beautiful. So I want to ask you a practical question kind of as we wrap up, um, you know, about how, how do nonprofit organizations, you know, in, in Indonesia kind of partner with companies? Mm -hmm. So what does that look like for you in terms, you know, if, if you haven't, you know, started working with nonprofits or you're interested in building Yaya Sons in the, in the future, um, what does that dynamic look like in, in partnering with organizations and, and what, how has that looked for you in, in the different organizations you've partnered with? So organizations partnering with Yayasan, you mean? Yes, okay. yes. Um, I think, so for example, in our company, we do have our own Yayasan um, that oversees all our CSR initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a company can go that route where they establish their own Yayasan and they establish what they want to focus on, particularly in the initiatives they want to be building. Um, or they can also partner with uh, existing Yayasan that they believe has already um, moved in that mission that they want to see through. Um, so maybe going back to your previous question about how I um, ended up saying okay to the Red Cross, for yeah, example. Yeah. I think, um, so on top of the Yayasan that our family owns within the company and also on top of the other initiatives that I've been um, involved with one of the things that I saw with uh, PME or Red Cross um, is that it's first uh, neutral mm -hmm. and then secondly it's um, not just nationwide but also it has links uh, to global so actually on our Swiss trip this past uh, week we got a chance to go to Geneva and meet with ICRC uh, global at the Geneva office, wow. and we got to also discuss about the various initiatives that um, the International uh, Center for Red Cross um, can also be poured into the Indonesian Red Cross. And I think uh, the reason why I said yes was because I think there was a lot to learn from them. Yeah, There was a lot to learn, but also I think the impact would be a lot bigger when we come into an existing organization that perhaps I've also heard that entering into like a, a big organization like that, um, there would be a lot of, I guess, like politicking going on. And that was definitely something I was not looking forward to. But I think we're coming in with, I guess, a posture of, you know what, I'm here to learn. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to make like the big change of shebang, you know? Yeah. And I love the fact that you brought up the story about uh, an old lady knitting at the back of the church because I'll probably be that old lady <laughs> <laughs> when I'm older. Um, and the reason why I say that is because oftentimes, I think especially as younger leaders, we aim at, for example, if we want to set up Yayasan, if we want to, um, partner with organizations like we want to make big change immediately right but I think there's wisdom in like small beginnings there's wisdom in taking the time to learn mm -hmm. um, there's wisdom in the quietness of yeah. life um, for me personally we're we're expecting our first child in October and um, I know that this coming season of my life, there will be a lot more, I guess, seclusion, <laughs> as perhaps a lot of uh, mothers might know. Um, but I think that will be a beautiful season in life where we don't have to make big changes. We don't have to make big shifts. Um, 
for me, one of the most impactful person in my life would be my grandma, mm -hmm. who has never earned a dime in her life, has yeah. never been profitable <laughs> in that sense, but yeah. who has relentlessly every day of her life, like, she would serve with willing hands. She would yeah. wake up earliest before anyone else, yeah. um, even um, the helpers at home. She would be the first to rise up. She would be the last to sleep. That's why I was never a party goer because if I didn't come home, she wouldn't sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> so someone like that yeah. was someone so influential in my life. And I think if I can just leave everyone with one thing, it's serving even in the hidden places um, never goes to waste in God's economy. Yeah. And I think when we talk about servant leadership, servant first, um, even serving where people don't see you, even serving in places where it doesn't give a big shebang, like that honors God and that yeah. is pleasing before him. That's really beautiful and God sees it, right? And, and we're motivated in wisdom because of him. So thank you so much for, for sharing your story and, and hopefully you have some, some takeaways from that. And I think one of the things that I really heard in what you said, um, we want to be motivated because we love God, you know, in the quiet, in the secret spaces. But we also need to be strategic about it. So thinking about in your organizations, are you going to have your own Yayasan? Are you going to invest in another, you know, organization? What are you going to do in advance? Because if you don't do it strategically up front, it's easy for your money to go away before you have a plan for where you're going to invest it. And so I think that, that there's a lot of wisdom. And, and the last piece I heard that you said so clearly across all your examples was, let's be a people of prayer. Let's ask God and trust that he um, is delighted in his love for us to answer and to guide us as well. So thank you so much. We'll say thank you to uh, Jessica for sharing with us today. Thank you.